After extensive research and reading multiple online forums, we decided to visit Eleuthera. What makes Eleuthera, the Bahamian island just 400 kilometers from Miami, so special? It's not just the celebs, regular folks love it too. From stunning nature and endless beaches to a rich history and culture topped with friendly locals, Eleuthera's got it all, cliche or not. Whether you're a foodie craving delicious eats, a nature lover seeking serene beauty, someone looking for peace and quiet to relax, or an adventure enthusiast ready to embrace the wild, Eleuthera has something for everybody. But is it too good to be true? Let's find out. American Airlines operates a direct flight from Miami International Airport to North Eleuthera Airport, flying 76 passengers on the Brazilian-made Embraer 175. The flight takes approximately 40 minutes, depending on the weather conditions, to reach North Eleuthera Airport and land on its 6,000-foot asphalt runway. While the airport is a basic airport, the staff is really friendly and efficient. The customs clearance took only a few minutes, and within half an hour of landing, we were driving our rental car to our home away from home in current settlement. Our rental car was a Japanese-made diesel Mazda CX-5 with the steering wheel on the right side, and we paid $85 per day. The car was in excellent condition and served us well. After leaving the airport, we headed to the North Eleuthera Shopping Center for grocery shopping. If you're craving vegan risotto and a bottle of cashew milk, you might be out of luck, but they have all the essentials at a reasonable island price. We stopped at 700 Wines and Spirits for a case of Kalik beer. 25 minutes later, we arrived at a rental cottage located next to current North Side Beach. The current settlement is one of the oldest settlements on the island and the birthplace of the Bahamas' first Prime Minister, Sir Roland Simonet. It's a quiet little town where everyone knows each other with a small grocery store, a library, and a post office. The main occupation of the local population is fishing, as evidenced by the small boats near the pier and the hidden beneath enormous cemetery for Queen Pink Conks or Strombus Gigas, as well as hundreds of spiny lobster shells thrown out and rotting on the beach. In August of 1992, the current suffered severe damage from Hurricane Andrew. Many older homes and docks, including the popular current club resort, were destroyed. The channel or cut between North Eleuthera and Current Island is a natural phenomenon that attracts thrill seekers challenging their buoyancy skills through diving or snorkeling. Drift diving the current cut was a major thrill in the 70s, drawing divers worldwide to stay at the Current Club Hotel and experience underwater flights at speeds of up to 10 knots or around 20 kilometers per hour. If you love it here, you can buy a beautiful house for a few million or a piece of waterfront land for a few hundred thousand to build your dream home. And if you're entrepreneurial enough, you can even create a new world-class resort. The opportunities are endless until a new hurricane comes by and Mother Nature resets itself. We enjoyed the current for its authentic charm. It's like a hidden gem that shouldn't be altered. The current also boasts a few pretty decent beaches, and for uniformity, we're going to use the same names for them that Brett Sigilo uses in his very helpful guide, The Beach Book. The first place we decided to visit was Riptide Beach, which is not particularly recommended in this book due to the dangerous currents. Getting there also wasn't easy, as you'll be driving on a very rough road. You'll pass the Bahamas Ferry Terminal, a Roman pool-looking place called the Canal, where the wooden mail boat, the current Pride, used to be parked when not in use. The canal has a small tower where paint samples were tested by exposing them to the elements through the window. The beach is secluded, rocky, with below average snorkeling. While snorkeling, we could only see exotic thickets of long algae that looked almost lifeless. When we moved closer to the current from this beach, snorkeling became more dangerous due to the increasing strength of this tidal current. It was written on the forums that somewhere here you can fish, and I tried to catch something. All I managed to catch was a baby Nassau grouper. The poor guy already had someone else's hook in his mouth. I cut off the protruding piece of fishing line and released it to the wild. If I ever decide to come to Eleuthera again, I will leave my fishing rod at home. 
Maybe it just seemed like this to me, but there are no places where you can fish from the shore in Eleuthera. The sea seemed completely empty and exhausted to us. Sometimes there was more garbage in the water than fish. Overfishing of fish, pink conch, and spiny lobsters has led to a reduction not only in the number of these marine inhabitants, but also in the food chain, the number of other species directly dependent on them as a food source. Sharks, stingrays, octopuses, giant hermit crabs, and others have suffered and declined in numbers as well. Imagine an amazing shell, queen conch, that has a lifespan of up to 30 years and reaches maturity at three to four years, mercilessly destroyed to please tourist appetites for only 80 to 100 grams of sea meat from each mollusk. One thing I know for sure is that if Strombus gigas disappears, it'll disappear forever and nothing will bring it back. It is known that all attempts made for artificial cultivation have not been crowned with significant success. And then the same thing will happen to the spiny lobster. Isn't it sad? If you move along the current back from the Atlantic side to the Caribbean side, there is a pier where the local postal ship, a real wooden ship called the Current Pride, parks. From the pier, driving onto the main road, you can drive through and not notice another small and cozy beach, Double Moon. Current Double Moon Beach and Marina Beach are very close to each other. People say that the area around the old pylons has decent snorkeling. That project was almost finished and ready for its grand opening when in August of 1992, it was destroyed by Hurricane Andrew along with Current Club. When we decided to swim, we noticed a four foot shark that came to check us out. And we changed our minds immediately. Riptides can be dangerous on this beach because it's close to the cut, but it is an interesting place to stop and explore. If you like this area, you can buy 1,000 feet of waterfront here for $3.3 million. Opportunities are endless. The current public beach is located just next to Marina Beach. It's a lovely public beach with easy access and parking, formerly the site of the current club resort. During our visit, we found it pleasantly deserted, offering a peaceful spot for swimming or observing fishermen clearing their catch. The dock provides an opportunity to snorkel and witness sharks, stingrays, and schools of small fish. Adjacent to the beach is Sir Roland Simonette Park, providing an opportunity to play basketball with friends when you've had enough of swimming or sunbathing. Sandbanks Beach is located just a few minutes drive from Current Public Beach. You can easily stop here on your way to or from the current. The access is straightforward and parking is convenient. It's a nice place for swimming with small kids. During a strong low tide, the sea bend begins to protrude from the water in some places, and it creates these islands of sand dunes. Upper Cove Beach and Ed's Bay Beaches are located next to each other right on the highway. We stopped, checked it out, took some pictures, and left. There's no privacy. There's road noise, and there was lots of garbage and sea debris around that the ocean washes ashore during storms and returns back to its people. If you look at a satellite image of North Eleuthera, you can see an interesting lake, and it kind of looks like a left hand, and it's called Left Handed Lake. We decided to check it out, especially since it was close to the highway on the way from Current to Low Bogue Village. What we found was really disappointing. It's a local dumping site and it's probably illegal. It's very sad and depressing to see all these wild ducks and other seabirds swimming amongst all this toxic waste. This waste penetrates and poisons not only this natural body of water, but also the groundwater. What a beautiful sanctuary for birds could have been made from this left-handed lake. If you drive from the village of Current to the east by taking the Queen's Highway, you can visit two settlements located not too far from each other, Lower Bogue and Upper Bogue. The name Bogue is derived from the word bog, signifying a wetland, and is unrelated to the nautical term bouge. A noteworthy stop in Lower Bogue is Uncle Tommy's Bake Shop, offering a delightful selection of treats such as coconut tarts, rum cake, fruit cake, and coconut bread, which were all incredibly delicious. Watch out for the speed bumps to avoid ripping the bottom of your rental car off. Lower Bogue Beach is easily accessible with ample parking space and is serene and often uncrowded. Upper Bogue is located at a higher elevation than Lower Bogue, hence the name. Upper Bogue Beach was dirty and it wasn't very exciting. We just took a couple pictures and we left. 
Driving north along the Queens Highway, we visited the Bluff Settlement, located on the west coast of North Eleuther Island. The settlement of Bluff was established by emancipated slaves in the early 1800s. Bluff is worth visiting to experience the offbeat Bahamian small town charm. Bluff Public Beach is located next to the government dock. After walking around Bluff, we returned to the Queens Highway and drove further north, reaching the end of the highway and at the T-junction we turned left because we wanted to look at the Spanish Wells Ferry Beach, which turned out to be a very dirty, noisy, and not very interesting beach. Located close to Jeans Bay Dock, where the ferry shuttles tourists to nearby Spanish Wells. If you park your car there, be careful as car vandalism happens quite often. Check with the locals about parking to make sure you don't come back to four flat tires. We didn't waste much time here and we went to visit the Sapphire Blue Hole. Finding this place was easy. You just need to turn right from above the T intersection where the Queens Highway ends. I must admit though, we spent a significant part of our vacation at this northern end of the island of Eleuthera. We didn't know the history of these places until we returned home, but we constantly felt around us as if there was something unusual and inexplicable. The Sapphire Blue Hole is a sinkhole. It's a mesmerizing spot with waters that boast a stunning sapphire blue hue. Getting there is a breeze right off the road and parking is convenient. Now here's the exciting part. There's a wooden platform that invites you to take a 20-foot leap into the dazzling blue. Many folks are doing it and enjoying the experience, but here's the real talk. Ensure you've got a solid plan to get back out safely. Given some past incidents, exercising caution is key. We're talking about avoiding the airlift to Nassau Hospital, because there's no hospital on Eleuthera. Seriously, don't attempt this jump alone. Safety first. Plus. The Sapphire Blue Hole is a natural backdrop for envy-inducing selfies that you and your friends will love. Oh, and a quick heads up, this isn't your average swimming spot. It goes deep, surpassing 100 feet. Our dive into the Sapphire Blue Hole? Pure enjoyment. The thrill of the jump mixed with the beauty of the surroundings? It's definitely worth it. After visiting the Sapphire Blue Hole, we drove further on the same road that brought us to the Preacher's Cave a famous historic place of Eleuthera. In 1648, the ship William embarked from Bermuda carrying a group of Puritans known as the Eleutheran Adventurers. Unfortunately, their journey faced adversity, leading to the shipwreck on a reef named the Devil's Backbone and the tragic loss of one life. Seeking shelter, the survivors discovered a sizable cave behind the beach ridge, later named Preacher's Cave. Preacher's Cave holds significant importance for history enthusiasts as it marks the site of the first church in the Bahamas and serves as the burial ground for the Eleutheran adventurers, founders of the current nation. Additionally, it features a unique prehistoric burial ground for the Lucayan people, who inhabited the island before Columbus arrived in 1492. Some of these burials include items suggesting a possible connection to afterlife rituals, one barrel even hints at a grim history of human sacrifice. The area surrounding the cave is also historically notable as the location of the first free black community in the country. Beyond its historical value, Preacher's Cave carries cultural significance, acting as a link connecting Spanish wells with the surrounding communities of Eleuthera. Scientists have identified a genetic link between the Eleutheran adventurers and the present population of Spanish wells. Remarkably, Preacher's Cave is currently home to wild bees. We counted several large hives and several smaller ones under the roof of the cave. In fact, there are many more of them they are simply not noticeable in the spacious limestone cavities. It seems that these wild bees feel really comfortable here. You can see how they fly in and fly out through the round hole in the dome of the cave. Here they find enough nutritious nectar in the tropical forest located around. The bees are absolutely peaceful and did not pay any attention to us. The coconut palms also grow here, with multiple groups of bright orange chanterelle mushrooms growing underneath. Pieces of decorations and garbage left behind provide evidence that this place is actively used for religious ceremonies, such as weddings. The locals diligently maintain the cleanliness of the area in the nearby beach, access is easy, and parking is convenient. Tay Bay Beach, often referred to as Preacher's Cave Beach, due to its proximity to Preacher's Cave, has been one of our favorite spots in North Eleuthera. However, it might not be suitable for kids due to its high waves. 
The beach is vast, beautiful, and it's usually deserted. You can enjoy the sight of boats passing by on their way to Spanish Wells or Harbor Island, and occasionally a friendly shark might make an appearance. The beach is clean and accessible from the Preacher's Cave parking lot. Take a stroll to the east side for further exploration of the Tay Bay area. Current Bay Beach is a hidden gem with stunning beauty, though getting there can be a challenge due to the narrow jungle road with overgrown branches and bushes. Be aware though that this is mistakenly labeled as Tay Bay Beach on Google Maps. While it's difficult to reach by car, it's undoubtedly one of the most beautiful beaches we've ever seen. The effort to reach it is well worth the reward. If you're concerned about your rental car, consider a 20 minute walk from the Preacher's Cave parking lot. Don't forget to bring a machete to clear out the path and open coconuts found along the way. You can easily spend the entire day here. Unfortunately, due to its challenging access, the beach may not be regularly cleaned and may have some debris and garbage. If you drive from the airport towards the bay past the Three Island Dock, you can get to the Three Rings Beach. Located on the west coast of North Eleuthera Island, we drove on a very bumpy road and parked at some boat loading or recycling facility. The beach has a fair amount of debris and garbage, but we liked it for its warm, shallow, and clear water. It has good potential if cleaned up a bit. We walked further north from the loading area and really enjoyed the good views of Harbor Island. You can see the planes taking off from North Eleuthera Airport and the boats from Harbor Island cruising by. Whale Point is a captivating area for nature and history enthusiasts. We would say it's another good place to visit. Unfortunately, little remains from the once opulent Whale Point Club and Estates, which opened its doors in 1966, covering a vast 300-acre expanse. The club included a main building, two hotels, cottages, a restaurant, a swimming pool, a private beach, and a marina. Today, all that's left are ruins, including the cancer clinic that opened in the early 1970s. And interestingly, one of the cottages on the site was the scene of a brutal murder in the late 1960s. Locating the access to Whale Point Beach can be challenging. You'll have to drive on a very rough and bumpy road, keeping an eye out for an opening in the overgrown bushes and trees. However, if you manage to find it, a stone stairwell will lead you to a beautiful beach with shallow and warm water. But what truly makes this beach special is the presence of turtles, occasional stingrays, and starfish. Just be quiet and observe them from the beach. When they get startled, they'll swim away with remarkable speed. The beach is clean, offers plenty of shade, and provides a sense of privacy with decent snorkeling. When we were tired from sunbathing and swimming, we decided to hike to the end of the road where Whale Point meets the Atlantic Ocean. From there, you can observe Harbor Island at a very short distance, with powerful ocean waves crashing on the rocks, creating a really loud sound. We noticed a few for sale signs, so if you like this area, you have another opportunity to buy a piece of land or a house. On our way home, we stopped at Bottom Harbor Beach, which used to be home to Bottom Harbor Beach Club. Sadly, this place was severely impacted by Hurricane Irene 12 years ago. However, we noticed that there is a new restaurant that has been built and it is likely open by now. About 300 meters east of the restaurant is the place where multiple boats take tourists to feed turtles. You can walk there at low tide, but please refrain from doing so. Feeding turtles can make them dependent on human provided food and too accustomed to being fed. When the slow season starts, they may no longer want to eat grass and could starve, not to mention the aggressive behavior that they may develop. People are getting bitten on a daily basis. On the way to Queens Highway, we drove by cenote and cat condos where good-hearted local residents feed feral cats. Harbor Island, or Bryland as the locals call it, was a destination we knew little about. Intrigued by the tales of the Harbor Island haunted house, we decided to venture out on a windy and wavy day, taking a break from the beach to seek it out. Returning to the airport, passing it, we arrived at a large parking lot of the Three Island Dock that disappointed us with the amount of garbage scattered around. It's hard to surprise us with anything, but such a large amount of waste was a shock, even to us. After a quick boat ride, we disembarked on Government Dock in Dunmore Town, the only town on Harbor Island. It greeted us with loud music, parked golf carts, and a bustling atmosphere and gasoline fumes. Opting out of renting a golf cart, we chose to explore this tiny island, measuring only 3.5 miles long by half a mile wide. 
Bryland proved to be not walk friendly, lacking sidewalks, and requiring caution for flying golf carts and cars. A marked contrast from the low key Eleuthera where we had stayed, Dunmore Town was a busy, tourist centered place different from our usual preferences. Bryland, with a history dating back nearly five centuries, was once the center of shipbuilding in the Bahamas, the first capital, a pirate outpost, and now a playground for the rich and famous, informally known as the Caribbean Nantucket. Following Google Maps to the Harbor Island Haunted House, we turned right onto Bay Street and soon found ourselves at the Valentine's Resort and Marina. We spent a few minutes there and continued our stroll, capturing images of vibrant houses and boutique hotels, our path led us to Ramora Bay Resort and Marina, a serene and empty spot during the low season. While walking along the dock, we discovered a delightful surprise, a couple of manatees. Gentle mammals protected in the Bahamas, but unfortunately not best suited for a marina environment due to boat propellers. Resuming our journey, we reached what was supposed to be the location of the haunted house, only to find a brand new fence surrounding the construction site of the 150 million Bryland Club residences and marina development. Disappointed but not surprised by this Google Maps misdirection, we persisted, following the fence towards Bryland Club Marina, where we discover it next to the new marina. Legend has it that a wealthy man built the haunted house in the early 1940s for his new wife. After spending only half an hour in the house, she fled, screaming. She vowed never to return, claiming the house was haunted by tormenting ghosts. They both abandoned the house, leaving everything untouched. People say the newlyweds simply disappeared, and no one ever saw them again. Over the years, the once grand building fell into disrepair and remained a popular spot for weddings and parties due to its post-apocalyptic charm. Now it is part of the exclusive 27-acre Bryland Club property. Bryland Club Marina, while not teeming with activity, was the temporary mooring place for the elegant Nina, a recently constructed 164-foot yacht. With the capacity to accommodate 12 individuals and six cabins, this modest vessel is available for rent for only $255,000 per week. We couldn't depart the island without paying a visit to arguably one of the most globally renowned pink sand beaches. We discovered a path leading to the beach between La Palmare and Sea Siren Villas. Pink Sand Beach greeted us with crashing waves and its distinctively pinkish sand. The beach part in front of the resorts and villas was reasonably clean, with a few individuals relaxing in their beach chairs enjoying margaritas. However, nobody was swimming, as the beach is not ideal for swimming due to its waves. It's an excellent spot for a leisurely stroll with your partner, capturing Instagram-worthy photos, especially if you enhance them with filters to intensify that vibrant pink hue. There are no restrooms or lifeguards or large resorts. Petty theft is not uncommon, and visitors should exercise caution. We walked a mile north on this beach, passing luxurious villas at $5,000 a night and resorts at $2,000 a night, almost reaching the northern beach access point. Unfortunately, in this area of the beach, we saw a lot of garbage. There were plastic bottles, personal hygiene items, and strange toys. The public beach access area resembled a dump site, marred by abandoned construction sites and litter. We opted for Bay Street, traversing through a town area that contrasted with the touristy parts. We walked by a power plant with noisy generators producing electricity. We learned from the locals that Bryland experiences power and water outages, impacting both local residents and visitors. Finally, we reached government dock and boarded a boat filled with locals who had finished a hard day's work on Bryland, sharing their happiness to return to Eleuthera. Wow! Oh my god! It is so beautiful, must-see, gorgeous, breathtaking! Those are the sentiments echoed in online reviews of the Glass Window Bridge. We couldn't resist and decided to stop there on our way to the Leon Levy Native Plant Reserve. Parking right on the bridge is limited, so you may need to park further away, perhaps close to Queen's Bath and walk. When parking, ensure that you don't leave anything valuable in your car, and it's also recommended to leave your car unlocked so thieves don't have to break the windows. The best pictures and videos can be taken from a camera drone from above if you have one. 
during stormy or wavy weather, it looks really dramatic, giving the feeling that Mother Nature doesn't like the bridge built by humans and is doing everything possible to destroy it. For ages, a natural stone bridge linked north and south Eleuthera. However, in the 1940s, a series of hurricanes devastated the seemingly indestructible land bridge, leading to the construction of a concrete replacement. Over the following decades, the bridge underwent multiple repairs using reinforced concrete. Unfortunately, in 1992 and 1999, Mother Nature showed no mercy as Hurricane Andrew significantly eroded the old bridge in 92, and the most severe damage occurred in 99. For over 48 hours, Hurricane Floyd, a Category 4 hurricane, relentlessly battered the glass window area with strong winds and waves, completely obliterating the original glass window. Despite the subsequent repairs to the bridge and the reconnection of Queen's Highway within a few months, Eleuthera's geography underwent permanent changes. If you fly to North Eleuthera Airport but stay on Central or South Eleuthera, there's always a possibility that the glass bridge will be closed due to ocean surges or adverse weather when you're on your way to the airport to fly home. In such cases, you may have to take a boat to cross. So beware of bridge closures to avoid missing your flight. After exploring the glass window bridge, you can venture to the hot tubs, or queen's baths, where beautiful lava rock formations, sculpted by the ocean, create natural tubs depending on the tide and ocean conditions. The best time to visit these hot tubs is during low or medium tide. It's also advised to wear sturdy water shoes, as the terrain is not suitable for flip-flops due to sharp and occasionally slippery rocks. Visiting during low tide allows you to explore the cave at the back of the cove without feeling at risk of being washed out to sea by large waves. Exercise extreme caution, as there have been recent incidents where individuals drowned when unexpected rogue waves emerged, washing them into the water while standing on the shoreline of Queen's Baths. On the southern part of the Queen's Highway, between Glass Window Bridge and Queen's Baths, you can find a blowhole, a small geyser that shoots up water. This phenomenon occurs only when the tide and waves are just right, and the height varies depending on the intensity of the water. Oleander Gardens is nestled between the Cove Resort and Galding Cay Beach. Oleander Gardens is a small residential development a little north of Gregory Town on the Caribbean side. The beach is easily accessible, albeit small, with rocky and shallow features. The water is calm, making it suitable for decent snorkeling, and water shoes are recommended. If you're lucky, you can encounter dolphins, starfish, sand dollars, and turtles. Hatchet Bay Cave is another interesting place to stop and check. The road leading to this cave is well marked, yet the actual opening to the cave is hidden amongst high bushes. Unfortunately, the cave interior is covered with graffiti. It's advisable to wear sturdy hiking boots or sneakers, and a flashlight is a must. There is no admission charge, no guards, and pretty easy parking. Hatchet Bay is amongst the longest terrestrial caves in the Bahamas, with passages twisting and turning for more than a mile, home to hundreds of bats believed to be leaf-nosed bats. The cave has impressive stalactites and stalagmites and other formations on the ceilings and walls. In one section of the cave, low passages barely clear the water surface, which rises and falls with the tides. Archaeologists have made significant discoveries of Lucayan remains here. Caves were often utilized as burial sites, reflecting the belief that they served as gateways to an afterlife. After exploring Hatchet Bay Caves, we set out to find Sweeting Pond, the renowned Seahorse Conservation Lake. On September 7th of this year, it officially became Seahorse National Park, encompassing 548 acres under the management of the Bahamas National Trust. Locating the entrance road proved to be quite challenging. There were no signs and Google Maps directions were utterly confusing. Driving back and forth multiple times, we kept passing the hidden entrance. Fortunately, a local lady provided us with directions and we finally found the road nearly obscured by all of the vegetation around. Parking our car on the highway, we grabbed our snorkeling gear and proceeded on foot. The path to the pond was lined with tropical plants and a lot of garbage giving the feel of a hidden dump site. Upon reaching the pond, we found a small parking lot and a sign providing access to the water. Swimming for 25 minutes, we scanned the lake bottom, covered with all sorts of sea vegetation, and initially couldn't spot anything except large, true tulip mollusks, flame scallops, and mangrove oysters. 
We thought we were deceived and there were no seahorses. But suddenly I noticed one. They're masters of camouflage, quietly feeding on the seaweed bed. The fish seemed to blend in seamlessly. Shortly after, more seahorses revealed themselves, suggesting they might have been observing us to ensure we posed no threat before making their appearance. As the lake community deemed us non-threatening, they began to interact further. A Bahamian coral octopus emerged, showcasing its beauty, almost as if it was conveying a message or attempting to hypnotize us. We observed a king crab shedding its old exoskeleton without attempting to escape from us. Unusual sea slugs with blue glowing colors, a red fireworm, and crawling brittle sea stars also captured our attention. It was a breathtaking experience. Sweeting Pond is a landlocked saltwater lagoon, 2.5 kilometers long, 1.5 kilometers wide, and 13 meters deep. This unique formation, known as an ankyaline pool, is made up of seawater flowing through porous limestone rock, separating the ocean and lagoon. It stands out as the best place we visited on Eleuthera so far, with unique ecosystems and endangered seahorse populations. The realization that there was once a plan to break the barrier between the sea and the lagoon and build another marina, akin to the one at Hatchet Bay, was horrifying. The loss that would have resulted by such a move remains immeasurable for us and for future generations. Another incredible day of exploration unfolded at the Leon Levy Native Plant Reserve the first national park on the island of Eleuthera managed by the Bahamas National Trust. Conceived and developed by Shelby White in honor of her late husband, the 30-acre reserve is now a safe haven for native plants in the Bahamas. For an entrance fee of $12 per adult at the Welcome Center, we received a map with trail directions. Just in front of the Welcome Center, we discovered the beautiful and tranquil coconut grove with waterfalls. Many plants throughout the reserve are labeled with both common and Latin names, facilitating a deeper understanding of the Bahamian flora. We started with the medicinal plants trail, where display beds were organized by ailment and the corresponding plants used for treatment. We enjoyed the mangrove boardwalk and wetlands trail, observing various species of mangrove trees, wetland birds, and other animals. Remarkably, all construction, including man-made rivers and a circulating groundwater waterfall, were accomplished without heavy machinery, preserving the fragile natural habitats. The trail showcasing epiphyte plants, including orchids, air plants, and bromeliads, was fascinating. We were fortunate enough to witness the blooms of Encyclia altissima orchids, known for their fragrant flowers, mostly in the winter months. While there are eight different species of orchids, most were not in bloom during our visit. Exploring the edible plants trail, we encountered exotic fruit-bearing plants such as the breadfruit tree, calabash tree, noni tree, mamiya tree, and dili, amongst others. The solar-powered composting restroom added a sustainable touch to the reserve. To our surprise, the reserve harbored various mushroom genera, including Emanita, Cantharellus, Boletus, and others. We also spotted different polypore mushrooms, including the renowned medicinal mushroom Ganoderma lucidum, or reishi, indicating the health of the tropical forest. Most of the mushrooms were observed along the Ethan's Tower Trail, a half-mile climbing loop leading to a wooden tower offering a breathtaking 360-degree view above the forest canopy approximately 75 meters above sea level. While we regretted not purchasing the $2 turtle treats at the welcome station, we were delighted to encounter a group of adorable turtles at the freshwater wetland. The pond, created from a former rainwater cistern, hosts a thriving community of freshwater turtles, known as Jamaican sliders, whose existence is closely tied to the endangered category. It was a remarkable and educational experience that left us with newfound knowledge and appreciation. Walking along the path called Applied Botany, we saw various types of plants that have an economic importance for the people of the Bahamas. Near the exit, there is a pavilion where reserve staff grow plants and conduct lessons for school children. The pavilion protects young plants from direct rays of the sun and from the wind. After exploring the Leon Levy Native Plant Reserve, We decided to visit the remnants of the old U.S. base and the adjacent beach. Our parking spot was once the catchment basin for rainwater. Rainwater was collected and treated and used for various things. 
Nature has gradually reclaimed this site, obscuring much of what once stood here. On September 1st, 1957, Nav Fac Eleuthera, a United States naval base, was established on central Eleuthera, accommodating 150 officers and enlisted men. It served as one of the underwater listening stations integral to the sound surveillance system and the integrated undersea surveillance system that tracked Soviet submarines. Specifically, the system was able to pick up on the unique sound signatures of the submarine's engines, allowing U.S. Navy personnel to locate and track these vessels. The U.S. Air Force set up an auxiliary air base at the location. Its primary mission was to function as a tracking station for the USAF Atlantic Missile Range, monitoring missiles and satellites launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Eleuthera housed the MISTRAM system, the Missile Trajectory Measurement System, a highly precise tracking system crucial for the Air Force and NASA. MISTRAM provided guidance data for Minutemen, Polaris, and other projects that demanded rigorous ballistic missile testing. On March 1st, 1980, NAVFAC Eleuthera seized operations after 23 years of service. Today, the Water and Sewage Corporation utilizes this facility as a desalination plant. The beach is large, deserted with large waves, deep water, and a lot of marine debris and garbage. Slide Beach and Round Hole Beach in the Hatchet Bay area were our destinations inspired by Brett Sigilo's description in the Beach Book, labeling them as two of the most unique beaches on the island. Our journey led us past the noisy Hatchet Bay electrical plant, continuing on a rugged road that passed by a dump site scattered with tons of nails. As we ventured further, the surroundings transformed into a secluded area without any homes in sight. The day we chose to explore happened to be quite windy, and as we reached our destination, all we encountered was the sight of an angry ocean with massive waves crashing against the shore. Despite the challenging conditions, we managed to capture some pictures before deciding to head back. Here's the tip. Make sure to visit on a calm day. Overall, we quite enjoyed our trip, and if you like the information that we presented here for you, make sure to subscribe and we'll see you again. Mm -hmm.